Hello, today I'm going to be reviewing Antec's latest case, the Dark Cube, and I've actually already done a full step-by-step -step PC build guide in this case. And if you haven't seen that, you'll find a link to it in the description. So the Antec Dark Cube, as you can see from it, is a premium looking case that looks unlike anything else on the market. It's currently on sale in the UK for just under £180, and as you'd expect at that price point, it's made from premium materials and has a lot of unique features. The case is made from 3mm thick aerospace aluminium alloy on a steel frame with lots of glass. Out of the box, the case comes with a diamond grill mesh front panel, which should give great airflow. This panel can be removed by pressing a button on the front, lifting the panel up, and then it can simply be lifted away. In the case accessory box, we've got an optional glass front panel, which is easy to switch out. Whether doing this is a good idea in terms of temperatures, I'll be covering later in the review. In each of the four corners at the front of the case, we've got ARGB lighting bars, which can be controlled by a button on the top of the case. Just in front of the LED control button, we've got a very premium power button. Below that, we've got the front I.O., which comprises of a headphone and microphone jack. We've got two USB 3.0 Type-A ports, and we've got a USB 3.1 Type-C port. On the top of the case, we've got a glass panel with vents below it, and this is designed to show off your GPU. And yes, you did hear me right, I did say GPU, and this is because this case hosts an inverted motherboard design. So your GPU is actually going to go at the top of the case rather than at the bottom. Both of the case's side panels are made from tempered glass and with the case being named the Dark Cube, it's no surprise these panels have quite a dark tint to them. The side panels are held on with four pegs at each of the corners and can be removed by simply pulling them forward. The case features a slide open design and once you've removed four thumb screws at the back of the case, the internal frame of the case can simply be removed from the outer frame by pulling it backwards. And this design choice should mean you're going to have great access during the building process. With the internal frame removed, you can see we've got a single dust filter at the bottom of the case for the power supplies intake. This is fairly simple to remove, although you're only going to be able to do this with the internal frame removed. So you might be wondering, with all the case's I.O. cables attached to the internal frame, but the buttons and ports on the outer frame of the case, how that works. So Antec have come up with a really ingenious solution. They've used a PCIe type connector and whenever you plug the internal frame into the outer case, it makes contact and connects everything up. Looking at the internal frame of the case where all the I.O. cables come in, it's really nice to see that Antec have included both a fan hub and ARGB hub in the case where you can connect three four pin fan connectors or three three pin five volt ARGB cables. And then you're gonna be able to use the ARGB controller on the case to control the RGB and anything you plug into it. As you'd expect, there's a four pin fan connector coming from the hub and also a three pin five volt RGB connector. Once you plug both of these into your motherboard, your motherboard's gonna be able to control the hub and anything plugged into it. So moving on to look at the case specs, the case will accommodate both mini ITX motherboards and micro ITX motherboards. We've got a very impressive CPU cooler height of 175 millimeters. The case has four toolless PCI expansion slots and will accommodate graphics cards up to a maximum length of 330 millimeters. It's good to see the case has a power supply mounting bracket allowing you to slide your power supply directly in from the back and power supplies up to a maximum length of 220 millimeters are supported. The case doesn't come with any case fans included, but you can mount either two 120 or two 140 millimeter fans at the front and one 120 millimeter fan at the rear. And part of the reason you can fit such a large GPU in the case is the front fans mount outside the internal frame. For radiator support, as you'd expect, you can fit a 240 millimeter radiator at the front, although a 280 millimeter radiator isn't supported. At the rear of the case, you can fit a 120 millimeter radiator. In the rear compartment of the case, we've got a single drive mounting bracket. It's held on with a thumb screw. Once this has been loosened, the bracket can be removed by lifting it upwards. On one side of the bracket, you can mount a two and a half inch drive, while on the other side, you can mount a single three and a half inch drive. So just before I come on to look at the case thermals, I want to give you a recap on the build I put together in the case. So the build I put together was with an i9-11900K being cooled by Cooler Master's ML240 Mirror AIO. 
On the radiator and for case fans, I used Corsair's LL120 fans. And for our graphics card, I used NVIDIA's RTX 3060 Ti. Looking at their temperatures, our CPU idled at 34 degrees, while during a 20 minute IDA64 stability test, our CPU reached a maximum temperature of 92 degrees. Our 3060 Ti idled at 32 degrees, while it reached a maximum temperature of 71 degrees during the 20 minute IDA64 stability test. Looking at the noise levels, at idle the average noise level was 35 decibels, while under the 20 minute IDA64 stability test we had an average noise level of 51 decibels. So I was really impressed with the temperatures, our i9-11900K is actually a pretty hard CPU to cool, and the temperatures we got were fairly acceptable. And I think that was largely due to the fact that we were able to have a 240mm AIO set to intake. I was however worried that our GPU temperatures were going to be much worse than what they actually were because we were dumping a lot of hot air into the case and we had a glass panel on the top. But I've actually used the same GPU in a larger case with much more case fans and got very similar temperatures. So the design of this case with the GPU at the top seems to work fairly well. Noise levels, they were very acceptable and actually fall probably in the moderate range. The next thing I wanted to look at was what would happen if we changed out the mesh front panel with the glass panel that comes in the accessory box. So looking at the temperatures, our CPU idled 5 degrees hotter with the glass panel, while under the 20 minute IDA64 stability test, the CPU reached a maximum temperature of 104 degrees, which was 12 degrees hotter than with the mesh front panel. That wasn't the end of the story. With the mesh panel, the CPU didn't throttle at all, but with the glass panel on, the CPU throttled by as much as 25% during the IDA64 stability test. Looking at the graphics card temperatures with the CPU overheating and dumping much more hot air into the case, it was no surprise these went up with the glass panel. So they increased by 2 degrees at idle and 3 degrees under load. Noise levels were however unchanged with the glass panel. So I think the results here are fairly conclusive. Stick with the mesh panel on the front of the case and leave the glass panel in the box. The next thing I want to do was test how good the case was for air cooling. And with a maximum cooler height of 175mm I was able to mount Noctua's NHD15 and I was pleasantly surprised it fitted. I did however mount the cooler with the internal frame already inserted into the main body of the case and I would have had some concerns that if you had it mounted in the internal frame and then tried to slide it in, definitely the fans would have caught on the way in. So looking at the temperatures with the NHD15 our CPU idled 2 degrees hotter while under load it idled 6 degrees cooler. And so we were no longer dumping lots of hotter into the case you'd expect our GPU temperatures to go down and that's exactly what happened. At idle the GPU came down by 3 degrees, while under load it came down by 5 degrees. There was no significant difference to the noise levels with the air cooler, with the air cooler being 1 decibel louder at idle and 1 decibel quieter under load. So looking just at the temperatures, it's fairly clear you're much better going with an air cooler in the case rather than an AIO. But we also need to look at the aesthetics and the build I put together with the NHD15 I thought in no way did it look as good as the build I put together with the AIO. Now that of course is just subjective and that's my opinion, but my recommendations for building in this case would be to use an AIO. It's going to give you very acceptable temperatures, but it's just going to look so much better. And in my opinion there's absolutely no point paying £180 for a case that looks this good to ruin it by dumping a big air cooler in the middle of the case. So this brings me on to what I liked about the case. And this case has a whole host of great features that we've already covered, so I'm not gonna list them all again. But I think the biggest thing I like about this case is its looks. And it's fairly obvious this is a showcase. It's gonna look incredibly well on your desk. But importantly, it's a showcase that comes with two main features that you don't normally find. Firstly, it gives you great temperatures. Secondly, it has good dust filtration because a lot of the showcases you get, quite often they're open framed, there's no filtration at all, so while they may look great, you would worry about your components and the long term life of them. So this case ticks all the boxes. So moving on to some of the things I didn't like about the case, and I think the biggest issue I had with the case was cable management. I was actually well prepared for this because I had looked at a few other reviews before I built in the case. And cable management kept coming up 
and in particular the lack of space at the back of the case and the warning had been whatever you do don't use cable extensions with this in mind the power supply that i used came with flat cables and i only actually ran one power supply cable down the back of the case it was a thin flat cable and i had it well cable tied to the cable anchoring points at the back of the case and it looked pretty well but the problem came whenever i tried to slide the internal frame back into the case at the end and this tiny thin cable caught on the frame so i could imagine in this case if you weren't prepared for this and you'd actually use standard power supply cables or even worse cable extensions spent all the time putting your build together all the cables looking really well and you would have absolutely no chance of getting the internal frame into the back of the case so my advice for you is be really careful what cables you're going to use whatever you do don't put any power supply cables down the back of the case even though there is cable anchor points there because you'll finish your build and then get a really nasty surprise and you're going to have to undo all your cable management the next point i'm still trying to work out is it actually a true negative to the case but if you are thinking of getting this case it's important you know about it so that's the reason i mention it and that is that the tempered glass panels on the case have an incredibly dark tint to them with the lighting on the pc turned off this actually looks incredibly well with the dark tint and the aluminium alloy on the outside of the case the light reflects off the whole case looking great the downside of this is even when you have all the lighting on the inside of the case turned on it can still be quite difficult to get a good view of your components the next thing i wasn't such a big fan of was the tool free method for securing the gpu so all four of the pcie expansion slot covers are held on with a single bracket once you've removed the two thumb screws securing the brackets and you actually move the bracket away all four of the pci expansion slot brackets actually fall away once you've secured your gpu in place and the two additional brackets because i had a dual slot gpu you need to actually hold the gpu and the additional expansion slot covers in exactly the right position to get this bracket back on again and it can actually be really fiddly to do so this brings me on to my final point and for me this is probably the biggest issue i have with the case so because of the inverted motherboard design the viewing window into the case where you got to look in and see all your components is actually on the opposite side of the case so this is going to mean that you're going to have to set the case on the opposite side of your desk if you want to look in and see your components so this may or may not be an issue for you for me i have done a lot of work setting my desk up i have lots of channels onto the desk for all the cables and all the cables are coming out at a point on the right hand side of my desk and for me then to use this case and to want to look in i would then have to move it to the opposite side of the desk and redo all that cable routing onto the desk so now we reach the point in the review where i need to tell you should you go out and get this case so obviously this is an expensive case but in terms of looks and features i do think it is worth the money so if you are looking for a showcase that gives you great temperatures and you don't have your setup set in a way that it's not going to give you a big problem having the case sitting on the left hand side of your desk then definitely i can recommend this case so hopefully you find the review useful if you have please remember to give it a thumbs up and if you're not currently subscribed to the channel please hit the subscribe button as well thanks for watching